ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so we spoke about the lineage of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam up to it was up to um, hashim now inshallah we're moving on to the next which is abdul muttalib ibn hashim abdul muttalib ibn hashim was when he was uh, when hashim went to um, Asham, he became um, sick and he actually passed away and his grave, his grave is in Asham, his grave is actually in Asham. When he went, he took his wife with him and because uh, he had passed away, when she came back to, uh, to Medi to uh, you know, she, on the way back home, she was originally from, from Medina, from the tribe of Banu Najjar. And she was known as um, Salma bint Amr from the Najjari family, and from, the, from Banu Najjar, from the clan of Banu Najjar. And from the, they were from the Khazraj. And she was pregnant with a baby, with the son of Hashim. When she, when she came back, she had no place to go And everyone from that time on knew him as Abdul Muttalib. Of course, now that he grew up in Mecca, and he had, you know, the position and the status that he had, 
he was he eventually came the, became the leader of the you know the, the of Banu Hashim the children of of course Hashim from that from the Qurayshi side of the of the clan, of uh, of the clan. Now, how did he become famous? Abdul Muttalib became legendary. How did he become legendary? Remember, during this, during the time of of the Khuza'a, when the Khuza'a conquered Mecca, the tribe of Jurhum, they buried the well of Zamzam, and every time they would look for it again, they were not able to find it. And of course, it was a result of, uh, Wallahu alam, some of the scholars said, because of the shirk, because of that, um, you know, the, the, the idols and so forth, that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the well of Zamzam from the people at that time. But Abdul Muttalib, he was very, you know, very handsome. He grew up as a, you know, very, some, to be someone who was very, very respected. And then he had, he had a dream. He was sleeping, or he was sleeping in the shade of the Kaaba. And this is where he would stay in the afternoons. He would stay in the shade of the Kaaba. And it was only he who would be there. Nobody was allowed to be in that area. So he was like, because of his great respect, that was, the play, that was, the, that was like his place. That was his reserved place. Sort of like a place where you just sit down, watch people make tawaf, and watch your people. So it's sort of like his throne at that time. You know, if, if this was an area where you would make, uh, you know, a king would stay, that was his place. When he... He went to sleep and he saw a dream. In the dream, he saw a man come to him. That man came to him and he said, Dig up Tayyibah. Dig up some, the pleasant one. And he said, What is this pleasant thing? And then the man left. Then he went to sleep again. And he said, Dig up. He went another, the same man came again in his dream. He said, Dig up Mabnuna. Dig up the one, Magnoon is something that's hidden, that's a secret, something that's, that's forgotten or hidden. And he says, what is this? And so the man, said, the man just leaves, and he doesn't answer him. And he comes again, giving the different names until finally, he says, dig up. And one of the, remember, this is also the dream. One of the signs that our dream is from Allah, is that it repeats itself. So sort of like a mini-series. And you know how the king of um, the king of Egypt, when he saw the seven fat cows being eaten by seven lean cows, he saw that dream, and he knew that this was something that had a meaning. It was not just subconscious thoughts, because it repeats itself. And if you see a dream repeat itself, it's an indication that it's from Allah. Because one indication that a dream is not from Allah and it's just from your subconscious thoughts is that you wake up and you forget everything. You say, I, you know what? I had a long dream. And you know that it was very long because you can feel it. But then you try to remember it and you only remember one thing from it. Like you, you know that it feels like it's a three, four hour long dream. But you can't remember anything. These are dreams from your subconscious thoughts that you don't remember, so you know that's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that which sticks to you, and you're always thinking about it, and it comes again, that's an indication that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had this dream. And this dream comes again, the same man comes, and he says, dig up zamzam. Zamzam tasti al-hujaj al-a'zam. Zamzam will provide water for the main pilgrims for the major pilgrimage. And it is between guts and blood. Guts and blood at the ant colony under the feet of the ghurab al-a'asam. Under the feet of the crow, the type of crow in the desert, the ghurab al-a'asam. It has sort of like a, a reddish, um, reddish feet, sort of like, a, you know, very, very bright orange to red, red feet. So that's the type of crow you call the ghurab al asam He said, okay, what does this all mean? Between blood and guts 
at the ant colony under the feet of the Ghurab al Asam. And there's this red cr- uh, feet with red crow. I mean, sorry, red crow. Crow with red feet. <laughs> and so, what does this all mean? He does not know what it means. Until finally, he goes to, he's sitting under the, under the shade of the Kaaba, and someone has slaughtered a camel. And you know, they used to slaughter their, they used to slaughter and sacrifice for these idols. And so they, somebody slaughtered a camel. And you know, when they, you slaughter the camel, there's a pile of blood. And what happens with the, you, after you take the meat and you distribute it, eat it, and whatever you do with it, the one part that you don't eat are the intestines. So you keep it, and then you, you, you take everything that you need, needs to be taken. And you can't leave it in front of the Kaaba right there. You have to clean it. So he, they pull it. And they're bringing it away to, to throw it away so it doesn't stay there. Of course, there's a pile of blood. And then there's a pile of guts, right? From the camel. From the intestine and so forth from the camel. And then all he looks and he sees, you know, a, a, a roll, uh, a long line of ants you know, from an ant colony. But you don't know the exact location. It's like, you know how the ants, when they, they follow each other, right? You have a long line. They're helping each other carry stuff, right? And they're very organized. So hey, then he something clicks, okay? Blood, guts, ant colony. What's missing? A crow. So all of a sudden, a crow flies down. There are some pieces that are like laying down as a result of the pulling of it, and it's coming to eat those pieces. And he comes down right at the ex- location, you know, towards just away, a little bit away from the the black stone. He comes and he e- eats from there, and he says that this must be it. This must be the meaning or the interpretation of the dream. The well of Zamzam is here. So he goes, he goes home. And he says, Al-Harith, Ya Harith, come here. Let's go, we have to, you know, we have, to, we have something to do. We have to dig up, dig up. And so he starts, they bring their digging equipment. And they start to dig and everybody's making fun of him. Well, what are you digging here? Like, what are you doing? Because we have to understand, that's an area where people are making tawaf. And you have no reason to dig in that area. So he's digging and people are objecting to it. And then, lo and behold, what does he find? He finds the well of Zamzam. The lost well of Zamzam is found by Abdul Muttalib. And the people of Mecca, they know the legendary well of Zamzam. But then, they say, Oh, Abdul Muttalib, you found our well. Meaning, hey, this well belongs to all of us. Right, this is the well, the famous well of Zamzam during the time what time of Prophet Ismail. It was uh, discovered during, during that time, and then it was lost, and now it's found again. And so Abdul Muttalib looks over and he says, "Do you mean my well? What are you talking about? Our well?" And so they said, "No, no." They're arguing, and so there's a dispute on who should take whether it's Abdul Muttalib's well or everybody's well to look for that sorceress so that she can decide on this matter. So they start to go. All the nobles, remember, are leaving Mecca. And then, you know in the desert, if you make one wrong move or just one thing goes wrong, you find a well and the well is not, no well, anything can happen. But if you don't have water, it's gone. You're gone. So they run out of water. Something happens along the way and they run out of water. Everybody runs out of water. In fact, Abdul Muttalib is the one that runs out of water first. And so he asks them, can we have some, can I have some water? And they never give it to him. But they themselves also eventually run out of water. And if you are in the desert and you run out of water, you only have one or two days. You don't have long. If, you do not, if the next well is four days away, you're dead. Well, you don't have that, that, that much time. By the time you get there, you have no water, you dehydrate really quickly, that's life. And so they, they decide, you know, they, they don't have water, and they know that they're going to die. Because the next well is too far away for them to get to it in time. And so, Abdul Muttalib, he realizes this and he says, you know, we lived, we lived as nobles. We should also die as nobles, we should die with respect. We should not die and be, our bodies be left out in the open for vultures and animals to eat from it. 
that you because they remember the Arabs they are they are they're very very worried about their reputation. What if this story comes out that hey your great great grandfather when he died wolves and and and, and, and animals of the desert ate from his flesh. How despicable, how disrespectful that would that be, right? And so they did not, oh, he did not want that to happen. So he said, he said, okay, everybody, we lived as nobles, we're going to die as nobles, let's dig our graves. Everybody dig their own graves. The last person to die, okay, if you didn't, let's say you, you, you've died, and there are some people still alive, we will bury you. That, that way everyone is buried and not left for the animals to eat from their flesh. That's, that would be dis very disrespectful. And then the last person, all you have to do is sleep in your grave. When death comes, you'll be buried. Right? You know, the winds of the desert and so forth. Eventually, you know, everyone will have a grave. We have to die, live as nobles, we die as nobles. Dig, let's go, let's, let's dig our graves right now and just wait for death. We have no other option. Abdul Muttalib digs and everyone digs. But the difference is Abdul Muttalib starts digging and he finds water. In the middle of the deserts, he finds water digging his grave, he finds water. And so they said, they're so happy. They're so happy. Of course, they're not complaining right now. He has water, right? <laughs> they're about to die. They said, let us take this as a sign that the well in the well of Zamzam belongs to Abdul Muttalib. It belongs to him. Forget about taking, let's go, let's go back. You know, if Abdul Muttalib can find water in the middle of nowhere, that's his, that's his well, let's give it to him. Right, and so they all go back to Mecca, and they have, okay, it's all yours, Abdul Muttalib, take it. You have to understand. Remember, when you live in Mecca, and when you are in charge of the pilgrims, Everybody knows you. Because when the pilgrims go make pilgrimage, when they go home, what do they have? Stories to tell. And so Abdul Muttalib, people, the children, when they grow up, when they grow up, they're, before they go to sleep, mothers in Arabia would say, let me tell you the story of Abdul Muttalib. It became legendary, like folklore, sort of like, how people tell their children about Cinderella and even though, it's, even though it's fake, but this is real. And so everybody knows who Abdul Muttalib is. Not only that, but he is the one that discovered the well of Zamzam. They tell the story of how he, you know, how he saved the nobles of Quraysh by you know, finding water in the middle of nowhere. And his dream, his dream was even very, very, you know, uh, had meaning. And so he became very famous and everybody who comes, let's say they're in the old days, sometimes you're famous, but nobody knows what you look like. Because in now, in our time, if somebody is famous, their, their face is all over. Right? Their face is on TV, in billboard, magazines, everywhere. During those days, you might be famous, and everyone knows who you are, but nobody knows what you look like. They know your story, so every time they come to make hajj, ah, it's Abdul Muttalib right there. Oh, he's the one that, you know, my grandmother used to tell me before I used to go to sleep when I was a kid and stuff and things like that. But that's how Abdul Muttalib was. And that's how the Quraysh were. They were the royal family. You know how the royal family in, <laughs> in England, every time something happens, if they go to a public bathroom, it's in the news. Right? <laughs> you know, if, so, if they just fall one time, it's in the news. Whatever happens, it's always in the news. Everybody follows the, what, what's going on with the royal family. That was how the children of Hashem and the Quraysh, <coughs> the Quraysh were. And the most famous of them was Abdul Muttalib. And then something else happened. Abdul Muttalib realized that it even raised his status even more. Abdul Muttalib realized that if he realized if he were to have more sons on the day that he discovered the well of Zamzam, if he had 10 sons, there was no way he had to go through all of this. Why? Because having a son was strength and power and authority in those days. So let's say if someone wanted to dispute the matter, 
And he had more sons because he only had one son, Al Harith. It was only Al Harith. And if he had more sons, if the people were disputing with him about who should have the well, all he had to do was tell his son, sons, put on your armor, get your swords ready, let's come out. And so they stay around the, around the well. Imagine 10 sons in full armor with the sword in their hand around the well. Now tell me this well belongs to who? Right? Will anybody say anything? Nobody would say anything. So that's what he was thinking. You know what? If I had 10 sons, I would not have had to go through all of this. Just because only he had one son, he had no support. Who does he tell? Okay, come on, for, take it from me then. The only two, the whole group. He can't, he can't force the situation. So he, after thinking about this whole incident, he made a vow. He said, by Allah, if Allah were to give me 10 sons, I would slaughter the 10th for him. I would slaughter the 10th for him. And so, in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did give him 10 sons. And everybody knows this vow. Remember Arabia, they're hearing about it already. And he gets 10 sons. Now the 10th son is here. What is he going to do? He's born and he brings Abdullah to the Kaaba. The 10th son is Abdullah, who is the father of the Prophet wasallam. He brings him to the Kaaba and he's about to slaughter the 10th son. Sacrifice the 10th son for Allah. The people, who, who do you think is, gonna, is the first person to try to stop him? The mother, why not? She gave birth to the all this whole time I gave birth to this baby and all of a sudden you take him and you're going to slaughter him. So she tries to stop him, but he, well, he, he insists. And she tries to get her family to stop him. Everyone is trying to stop who? Abdul Muttalib from slaughtering his son. This is not right. Because if you were to do this, oh Abdul Muttalib, because of your position and status, we in Arabia will, con will continue to do this and this will set a tradition. Anyone who has 10 sons will slaughter the 10th one from now on. And so they said, don't do it. And he said, well, I made a vow. How am I going to fulfill this vow of mine? So they said, let's go to the sorcerers of Banu Sa'd. <laughs> <laughs> again, they went to the source of Banu Sa'id again. And this time, Wallahu Alam, she was there. She didn't have to go too far. And so she said, let me think about it. Let me think about it. Come tomorrow. And then when, she, when they came back, she said, how much is a life worth to you? What, if someone kills another person by mistake, what is the price of life? What is blood money? And so they said, blood money is ten. 10 camels. At that time it was 10 camels. After this incident, the price of a life rose to 100 camels. So it was right. If he would have slaughtered the tent, everyone would have followed. And so he said, she said, okay, if it's 10 camels, then I want you to pick lots. Every time you pick a lot that says you, can, you have to slaughter, that says you have to slaughter, uh, slaughter Abdullah, you have, that's, one, that's worth one life. So if they, if you, unless you pick the camels, then you can slaughter the camels. But if, it, if Abdullah comes, then you're going to have to add 10, 10, 10 camels every time. So he kept on picking, picking until finally it got to 100 camels before he, was, he had the opportunity to slaughter the camels. So now he slaughtered 100 camels. 100 camels is a lot of camels. That's a lot of meat. In those days, you have meat, you usually preserve it and you save it. But now he has to slaughter 100 camels. And so he does slaughter 100 camels. But on pilgrimage, the pilgrims and in Mecca that year, there was so much meat that the poor people had the opportunity to eat. They had enough meat year round. And when the, when the pilgrims came, they had plentiful meat. And so the story also reaches the pilgrims and the pilgrim goes out and he's telling about how, how the vow of Abdul Muttalib was and what happened and how, the, how he was supposed to slaughter him. So everyone of all the children of Abdul Muttalib, who is the most famous son? It's Abdullah. Everyone who comes, 
they come and they've heard about Abdullah from their grandparents or from their parents or from someone who has made Hajj. Before they go to sleep, even the children know Abdullah. But they don't know what he looks like. So when they come to make Hajj, everyone's going, Oh, do you see that's Abdullah? That is the guy that who was supposed to be slaughtered. Nobody cares about the other sons. <laughs> do you understand? They're the most famous son of Abdul Muttalib. That legendary Abdul Muttalib is Abdullah. Everyone knows Abdullah. Everyone knows. And that's why when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was born, the day that he was born, and the day people heard that this is the son of Abdullah, everyone is speaking about it already. Because everybody knows Abdullah. Everybody knows Abdul Muttalib. Everybody knows Hashem. Everybody knows Abdul Manaf. Everybody knows Qusay ibn Kilab. They are the royal family in Arabia. Even though there was no royal family, but they were the ones who were most respected. They were the ones who were helping the pilgrims. They were kind and generous. Whenever people need, they give them food. They give them water. Everyone loves them. They are the people who are the most respected. But then something happened. The year that the Messenger of Allah wasallam was born. And on that year... On that year, this incident, the incident that occurred was an incident, sorry, an incident that the incident that occurred was an incident that raised the status of Banu of the Quraysh. Raised the status of the Quraysh even further. It made it establish them as the people of God. That they are the people whom God will help. What happened? It was the incidents of the elephant. What happened during that year? During that, there was a year. Remember those years? They did those those times, the old times. They did not have a specific number for a year. If something happened in that year that was considered significant. They would call that year and they would say, that's the year of heavy rain. That's the year of the flood. That's the year of the locusts. When you have locust attacks and so forth. The year of the great battle. Whatever, the year, whatever happened in that year that was significant, it would give that year that particular name. So the year that the Prophet ﷺ was born was known as the year of the elephant because Abraha who was the governor of Yemen at that time. He wanted to call the Arabs to make pilgrimage to his place instead of going to Mecca. What would, ben what would be beneficial? Well, the thing is, if you have people, of course, people coming to your place, it raises your status. Secondly, it brings in business, so there's a lot of benefit from it. There is a, and it will make it a, tr a center of trading town in Arabia. But that Mecca was in the middle, and so it was the center of trade in Arabia. Because it was in the middle between who could safely trade between, North, between Yemen and Asham without any problems. Because they were respected. They were a respected tribe that the other tribes did not bother them. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembered, Allah reminded them of this great favor that made Mecca prosper as a trading town. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِإِلَى فِي قُرَيْشِ إِلَى فِيهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the trading routes. For be, he's swearing by the agreements of the Quraysh, the trading town between Mecca, between Sham and Yemen. Their trips in the winter, in the summer to Yemen and to, to Asham. And so this made Mecca very prosperous. But, and so that's why Abraha, when he saw that, the respect, the position and status of Mecca, he wanted his place in Yemen to be the same. And so he built a huge cathedral. Huge. And he called the Arabs, Oh Arabs, come and make pilgrimage to my place. Instead of the Kaaba. And what do you think the Arabs thought about it? 
I, I want you to imagine right now, in our time, if Barack Obama went on TV and he said, Hey Muslims, forget about Mecca. Forget about Me Me Mecca. Come to New York. Come to New York, we'll take care of you. Come to New York, or we'll provide for you. We got enough hotels to take care of you, and plus the weather is better. Right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll make a Kaaba for you, but come to our place. And he'll, yeah, and he's speaking to the American, yes, uh, this is what I'm trying to call the Muslims to do. And we're trying to raise, the, you know, bring back tourism. And if we get all the Muslims to come here, that would be very good. Right? For if he were to do that, what do you think the Muslims would do? Would they give nationality also? Huh? Would they give nationality also? I don't know about that. <laughs> In either case, some Muslims would go for it. No, just kidding. <laughs> right? <laughs> You'll find somebody who's going to go for it. But what are you going to say? You, what are you talking about? This is our deen. You can't tell us to go make pilgrimage to your place you just made up right now. This is the house of Allah that Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Ismail built. Who are you? Right? Who are you? And this ugly little guy with no nose. That was Abraha, little guy, right? He actually, he took over Yemen. Yeah, he took over Yemen. He tried to, he tried to um, overthrow the governor the previous governor. And the previous governor said, you know, I don't want a civil war. Let's have a duel. Whoever wins, whoever wins, you just take over. Because he, he, was, he, was a, he was actually a general before. He was general in Yemen. And he was trying to overthrow the governor. But then the governor did not want bloodshed. So he said, let's have a duel. You win, you take over. If I win, you know, you're gone. Okay? And so when they had a duel, he cheated. He told his soldiers, he said, if you see me winning, leave me alone. If you see that I'm losing, then go in and kill him. Help me out. So right from the very beginning, he got his nose cut off. So he was already short, right? But he's short and ugly too now, without a nose. And so Abraha, he's trying to call people to make pilgrimage to his place. And one of the Arabs, when they heard about it, one of them, when he heard about it, he went to the cathedral at nighttime. And he defecated inside, and he smeared the walls with feces. He smeared the whole, all the walls, the wall with feces. When Abraha heard about this, or when he, when after this incident, he was furious. He said, I'm going to force the Arabs to make Hajj to my place, whether they like it or not. Whether they like it, it doesn't matter whether they like it or not, they're coming to my place. And so, he calls for a huge elephant to be sent over from, from Habasha, because Yemen was under the Habasha uh, empire at that time. And so, he, you know, he mustered a huge army, the, one, the, the largest army that the Arabian Peninsula had ever seen, mu being mustered up. Mm -hmm. And he started to go to Mecca. Why did they need elephants? Because elephants in those days were like the demolition machines. Right? You don't have these, you know, these uh, uh, bulldozers and things like that. The elephants were it. If you want to destroy and take any building down, you bring an elephant. That's what you do. And so they, he brought the elephant with the huge army and the Arabs tried to stop him. They in fact, they called for jihad. Anyone who stops Abraha and dies doing so is a martyr. So the Arabs tried to stop Abraha from reaching Mecca. But anyone who was in the way, they were demolished. And they were destroyed. Because this is such a strong and powerful army. And finally the army reaches Mecca reaches the outskirts of Mecca, sorry, in a valley called the Valley of Ja'arana. There's an open valley. And Abraha, uh, and Abdul Muttalib hears about this huge army coming. He knows that the people of Mecca don't have enough strength to defend Mecca against this huge army. Because many people already have tried and they failed terribly. And so, Abraha, he camps outside of Mecca and Abdul Muttalib decides that they should retreat to the mountains. Everyone retreat to the mountains. And he is supplicating to Allah. He's the last person to leave Mecca. Supplicating to Allah to, to help, uh, to, you know, supplicating to Allah to protect his house. Because he is not able to do so anymore. And of course, he's the leader, he's responsible. But he's not able to do so. And he can only put his trust in Allah. 
And so they leave to the mountains. And then Abraha calls. He wants to see who this Abdul Muttalib is. Who is this Abdul Muttalib that we hear about? This legendary guy. Let me see who he is. Right? He wants to talk to him. And so when Abdul Muttalib, when they call Abdul Muttalib, Abdul Muttalib comes. And Abdul Muttalib has about a hundred camels that was in the valley of Ja'rana. And when, Ab- when Abraha came, he took all the camels. He took, about, he took all of Abdul Muttalib's camels. So uh, Abdul Muttalib comes, and Abraha, when he sees how Abdul Muttalib is, because he's a big guy, and he's very handsome, big and very handsome, and his demeanor, just like, he, you just look at him, you know that's a leader. You know how some people, when they come in, say, that's a leader, yeah. Right, even before they talk, you know, that's the guy right there, right? That's him. Just the way that he walked in. Abraha, on the other hand, he, you know, they used to have carry like the seats and thrones of the, the people who go. He said he was sitting down on top. And then when he saw Abdul Muttalib, it would look very strange for him to be on top. And Abdul Muttalib, you know, the little short, ugly guy here. And then this guy, handsome, big. You know, it looks very strange to have him above telling him what to do. It doesn't look right. And so he went down and he sat down with Abdul Muttalib. So they were on the same level. Out of his respect, just looking at him, he respected him already. But that's the kind of person Abdul Muttalib was. He just called for respect. He was that type. He just called for respect. And so when he sat down with him, Abdul Muttalib, his first words that came out of Abdul Muttalib's mouth was, give me back my camels. <laughs> Abraha, you know how sometimes they say, it's better to be thought of fool, and be silent and be thought of fool than to speak and erase all doubts. Right? First of all, he thought that, you know, he was like, hey, all of this. And then when he spoke, he says, wow. I didn't know that, you know, I'm here to destroy the house of your, of your God, your Lord, the people who were you, the most respected place to you guys. And you're asking me about your own camels? That doesn't sound like, a, you know, proper for a leader of your status to be talking about in this serious time. Right, I'm going to go in and destroy the house with your, you know, that your forefathers built in respect for so long, and now you're going to ask me about your camels? So Abdul Muttalib looks at him and he says, that house has an owner. The camels have an owner. I'm the owner of the camels. Give me the house. The owner of the, uh, give, me, give me the camels. The owner of the house will protect his house. I'm the owner of the camels. <laughs> give me my camels. The owner of the house will take care of his house, will protect it. And so he goes, give him his camel, let's go. You guys, let's go. They're ready to destroy the Kaaba. They're ready to go, this is it. They're going to go and destroy the Kaaba. So they, everyone gets ready to go, and they're prodding the, 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 cat, the elephant to go forward. They're pulling it, but it refuses to move. They prod it, it refuses to move. They do all that they can to the point where they're prodding so hard, that it's bleeding and it still doesn't move towards the direction of Mecca. If they pull it to another direction, it moves. But anytime they pour, pull it towards the direction of the Kaaba, the elephant refuses to move. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his soldiers. From the direction of the Red Sea, the skies become dark. And birds are coming and they're flying towards the direction of the army. Each bird has three stones, one on its beak and two on the feet. And they're coming and swooping down and dropping these stones. And when the stones land on a person, it goes from the top and it comes out to the bottom. And then that person just becomes just black, darkened. Just like burning hay, or you know, burnt hay on the ground, and everyone who's next to that person, the skin is falling off. And the army, when it sees this, everyone is retreating and running back towards Yemen. Those who are able to escape are able to escape. Those who are killed are able to be are killed. But not everyone was killed because someone has to be alive to tell what happened. So the army escape. Some of the army escape, and most of the army are most of the army is destroyed. 
And so they go, Abra himself, he, did not, he was not killed on the spot. But on his way back, he became, you know, his, his skin was falling off. And he died, he did not reach Yemen. On the way back, he died, but of course, some of his soldiers did reach Yemen. And so news of this reached all over Arabia. And everyone is speaking about it. And they are saying that the Quraysh, they are the people of God. They are people that God protects. They are the chosen people. So if they follow whatever religion they follow, it must be the right religion. If they have that type of protection. This is a miracle for the Quraysh, for Mecca. Allah protected Abdul Muttalib. He was the leader, of course. And so this was in preparation for the final coming, uh, the coming of the final prophet and messenger. So that people will say, they will have no excuse. They can't say, how come we follow such a people? No, no, he was the most respected. And that's why the Khilafah, the Khilafah is always in with the Quraysh. Why? Because if you have, let's say for example, you have someone who is Pakistani or Malaysian, or you have any other one, any other group of Arabs that were not, that's not from the Quraysh, what are people going to say? Are the other people going to listen? Are they going to follow? They're not going to follow, right? Like let's say the Khalifa is from, the, from, from Malaysia. I'm not following no Malaysian guy right there. No more rights for life for me. No, just kidding. <laughs> you know, and if, it, if it's Pakistani, they're not going to... If it's Kuwaiti, the Saudis don't follow. If it's Yemeni, the Syrians don't follow. Nobody follows. Who's the one that everyone respects? The family of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the tribe of Quraysh. That's the only one that everyone, the whole ummah can come together and respect, be respected. And that's why the, the Khilafah is always in the hands of the Quraysh. Always in the position, because no, if you if you you can't unite the ummah under anybody else, it's not it's not it's not just just this reality. But you know, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, that final prophet and messenger had to come from the most respected tribe, and he had to be the one who is most respected, most noble. So people cannot make an excuse. So I can't follow him. He's from no. You, who do you think you are? What tribe are you from? Who, what tribe are you from? Who do you think you are? I can't follow him? Right? So you have no excuse. No excuse. So they became known as the people. Sort of like, this is, these are the people who will have the truth with them. And that is why when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, started calling people to Islam, why didn't the other people around Mecca accept it? Because they knew that he was the most respected. But then at the same time, the majority of the Quraysh are against him. They, the, the nobles of the Quraysh are against him. So they don't know who to follow. But what are they waiting for? They're waiting for the winner of this dispute. And that's why when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, entered Mecca and he became the victor, Everyone around the area, the Bedouin tribes and the other tribes, they knew that the, he had the truth with him. Because before they were confused. Who do you follow? The Quraysh themselves don't know who's right. So who do you follow? We know that, but they themselves are in dispute. But then when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi
Catholic groups because they knew that he had the truth with him. There was no more doubt because the Quraysh are following Islam. They're following Islam. And as a result of that, they came in groups. And so this particular incident prepared all of Arabia to follow the, the final prophet and messenger. And then when the messenger of Allah وسلم, was born, everybody knew who he was. Everybody knew that he was the son of Abdullah, who was the son of the legendary Abdul Muttalib, who was the son of the legendary Hashim, who was the son of the legendary Abdul Manaf, and the most respected son of Husay ibn Kilab. And so from that lineage, people, everyone knew him. And so that's why the people, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose from the best of people, but from the best and the most respected of lineage. But during that time in Arabia, there was a lot of, a lot of, um, in the world at that time, there were just a few people who worshipped Allah. There were few places, far and few. The whole world, you had just a group of people who followed the teachings of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And of course there were some Arabs who did not worship anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they were also very few. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he sent the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ فَمَقَتَهُمْ عَرَبَهُمْ وَعَجَمَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked upon the people on earth and he, he detested them. Uh, the Arabs and the non-Arabs, إِلَّا بَقَايَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Except for a few remnants of the people of the book. And so there was a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of problems, a lot of oppression, a lot of things before the coming of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the world, the world at that time, the world at that time needed it had needed the final prophet and messenger. And then from, yes, you had the question? Yes, in the previous one, in the year of the Yeres, at that time, were there idols inside the Kaaba? The yes, there were idols. Remember, the idols came during time of Jurhum. So, is Abdul Muttalib a Muslim? No, he's not. Well, he, they used to worship Allah. But they worship Allah and associated with Allah also. So, they're not considered Muslims. The Arabs, they believe in Allah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you were to ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? They would have said Allah. They believed in Allah. But what was the problem? The problem was that they worshipped with Allah other gods. And that was the problem. They believed in Allah. And most people, by the way, most people in the world believe in God. What's, prob what's the biggest problem? The biggest problem is that they associate in their belief with God, they believe other gods, they worship other gods, they don't worship Allah alone. So just because you believe that, the, that God created the heavens and the earth does not make you a Muslim. And by the way, the atheists have been very few throughout history. They were, they've never been the majority ever. They've always been a very small minority, very small. In the whole world, they're always a very small group, very small. Sometimes they are just very loud, that's all. And most of the time I mean, they're very loud, but they're very small. Very loud group, right? But they're a very, very small group always. They're all people believe in God, but they worship with other, they worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other gods, other deities, they, whatever, they may, whatever uh, they may worship. So, inshallah, I would like, uh, uh, what, what, how much time we got? Is that... Is it time already? One more hour. Okay, we shall, we'll, we'll, uh, is, it, is it break right now or do we have a... Okay, we'll take a five minute break right now, inshallah. I'll put the next slides in. If you have questions, you can also send them up, inshallah. I still have some questions.